Welcome. I think this presentation will carry on with the theme of scalability and how to run bigger projects, kind of following on from what Shani was describing to you. This one will be about running a program which just involves a lot of people. So just for background, um, Art and Feminism event uh, in 2015 had uh, 1,500 people being involved in it in 75 locations in uh, 17 countries. You might have heard some of that stats already. Um, those were people that got together to edit about art and feminism, um, created about 500, um, improved about 500 articles, created 400 new articles. Um, the initiative was covered in a series of mainstream media like uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and a lot of others. Um, this was a massive growth from a previous iteration of this event in 2014, where um, about 600 people got involved. So you can see the, the growth was pretty massive. Um, and the whole range of people got involved, like right, librarians, academics, curators, uh, Wikipedians and non-Wikipedians, uh, art lovers, um, allies, feminists, all sorts of people. Um, and I will be talking about how to organize this sort of global event. Um, and what was important for the organizers to make it work, but also how the local um, events were organized also. I think there is at least one person that was heavily involved in the last year's series of Art and Feminism. I can see Richard somewhere. And there might be other people actually in the audience that were involved in Art and Feminism. I can see some other hands. Brilliant. So um, hopefully if we have some spare time for questions, there could be, um, it could be that it's not just me that gives you a bit of background and explanation, but also people in the audience. And I'm hoping that I'll give justice to this pretty amazing event or series of events. Um, I'll be talking about how the 2015 series of events was organized, um, mostly focusing on the global um, level of, of how it was done. I think the important thing to notice is that it wasn't, it wasn't just a sudden success. It wasn't just that in 2015 suddenly there was a series of events and it really took off. Um, the important thing was that in 2014 there was already a massive but a pilot I would say of those initiatives and because it was successful it sort of established a very strong um, reputation for this almost a brand of art and feminism. Um, this is important because I would say that success breeds success. So people want to be involved in initiatives that were already seen as successful. Um, particularly, this is important where you want to involve institutions in your programs. Um, I find that prestigious, but traditional and cautious organizations don't sometimes want to experiment. They want, they, they want to sign up to stuff, but only if they've seen that it was already successful, it, was, it already worked somewhere else. Um, so having had that 2014 successful events meant that loads more people actually got on board with the next year's iteration. Um, we had that in UK with um, other programs as well. So, for example, when we did uh, women in science programs, the first year we did it, it was just with one prestigious organization. And the next year, loads more kind of just wanted to copy it and share in the success that they've seen already with others. Um, so one tip I would share from that, I guess, is trusted movement partners can boost the success and can mean that a lot of other people want to jump in as well and get involved. Um, I'll show you some pictures from the event, if it works. Um, so now I'll talk about organizing um, that massive structure that was the 75 events that I've uh, mentioned. The first thing that the organizers started from was this idea of working by theme and not by organization and what the organization 
content is. So they've chosen the art and feminism, and that was their starting point, rather than going to an institution and working out what sort of stuff they've had in their archives or collections. So they didn't go to, say, like Queen's Library and talked about, and then edited about Queen's um, history. They started from art and feminism and then found partners. And I think this is definitely the way to do it if you want to run a um, scalable, spreadable event um, and series of, of events. The other thing is to tap into professional networks that already have contacts with different groups and organizations that you want to work with. So, for example, with uh, Women in Science, we worked with Medical Research Council, who uh, then has different groups of women in science, um, I don't know, associations and groups of people, that meant that we were working with that one partner, but they were able to scale it up even more just because they had the connections that we didn't originally. And that means that the event can really grow. Another organizational learning point that I want to share from the um, organizers was to make um, a home base. That means some sort of um, home page for the event that allows for the coordination. And they found that having an off wiki could work better than, say, having a meta page. Um, they were using Tumblr, WordPress sites, and they had a Gmail group for all the coordinators as well to make it easier for people that aren't used, uh, aren't used to wiki um, to be involved with the program. Um, in UK, for example, we had several organizations join informally in the 2015 um, iteration, and because they were um, able to, con to join the Gmail group, they were able to see the, uh, the Tumblr site, it meant that it was much easier for them to join in. This meant that loads more people were getting involved, and again, the scalability was just growing. Um, I think it also means that using those other sites in, um, increases your visibility so you can reach to a wider audience. All very good things. Social media was used a lot. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, they had a very established hashtag, which again helped with scalability. Um, yes, this is slightly unconventional with our movement, but it means that it can scale, you can reach to more people. They had a lot of, um, a lot of the events were um, publicized on Facebook and then Eventbrite as well, rather than Wikipages. And that meant that people interested in those events, it was easy for them to sign up and they had ideas of, uh, of how many people would actually turn up. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about, again, about scalability, but about um, involving new people in organizing events. So there was a global coordination team, but a lot of the actual events were organized by local, say, country um, nodes. What that meant was there was some push to try and keep the message consistent so that every node and every um, event had a similar messaging around it so that it felt consistent within this um, art and feminism uh, program. But also, it meant that um, they didn't want to control the messaging 100%. Um, I think the... The important thing is that um, when people come in and get involved with art and feminism and they are involved in a wiki for the first time, they might not understand that we're quite open and you can do things in a lot of different ways. And it's the organizers of art and feminism found that it's very important to be explicit, that you can share remix, you can run an event and it doesn't have to follow like very explicit guidelines. You can kind of use your own event. And it's just very important to be open about this because otherwise people will go to you and try and check every little detail with you. And if the organizer team is very small, it means that they become blockers. So it's this sort of interesting balance between control 
and scalability. You can have loads of control if you have a big team and you can clear everything, but if it's just a small group of volunteers, um, you have to let go of some of the control and just provide people with some materials that they can just um, share in. Now I'll talk a little bit about what they found in terms of organizing individual events. This could be useful if you run any sort of um, editing event, but it was um, particularly important for them to establish some good practices um, with this uh, kind of devolved system of loads of different events in a lot of different countries. They had, they've identified four different needs to have a space, to have knowledge of the topic area, and to have knowledge of Wikipedia. That's uh, probably better, um, better to just have more than one person and of course have the participants as well. They had loads of different volunteers, not just Wikipedians, but librarians, um, activists. What was particularly useful was to have remote angel editors who were um, active during and active um, and after the event as well to just clear up articles, make sure that everything is just tidied up a little bit as those events were going forward. Um, a lot of you might know this, but it was particularly important with those high level of events to create um, the accounts for people before or to give organizers um, account creators, right? That just sped everything up a little bit. Um, I think the other thing to mention was that I think everyone can organize this sort of an event, but it would be it would be not transparent to to, to not admit that um, the organizers did get some financial support to do all of this as well. Um, they had two different grants. One to help with setup costs, to help with some infrastructures. They had uh, databases to help with this, um, and just things to help build the group. And they also had another grant to help with the operational costs, to help actually them with the time they spent into this. And also, there was a bit of money to support the actual events. And I'm sure you could do some of this stuff without any financial support, but it was so much work for them that it really helped to have that in the end. Another kind of really nice good practice that they've discovered for the events to have this sort of um, caretaker of the event who was um, inviting everyone, making sure they were signed up, getting their creators, their account creators um, account created and just creating a welcoming environment for them. One special thing, I think, about the art and feminist thinking, again, a bit globally, was the training they provided. Um, I think this is not as important if you just do one of Editathon, but with this many events, you do have to create some initial support before the events even get create, um, happen to make them run smoothly. And they've done two different things. They've run um, train the trainers, to specifically for the people that were interested in, art and to, in running art and feminists. That meant that um, they were training people who would then be active um, in, the, in the events and were able to train others in editing. Um, the other thing was that they were running um, actually actual editathon training to make sure that people know how to organize them. This just meant that when it came to the events, people already knew what they were doing and it, they weren't, the organizer team wasn't like a um, pressure point, like a blocker, and it was all running much smoother. One thing that was really important for them was the communication strategy, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about that in case that's um, interesting for you. Um, this might not happen if you just run a one-off editathon, but when you run this sort of an event and it really scales, the press does, in the end, get interested, and the organizers need to be ready for that interest. Otherwise, it's just um, a massive capacity problem. So they were creating loads of um, press kits. 
um, which meant that they were just ready for the press when it did come and when the interest was really building. So they had um, picture library, biographies of the organizers, any sort of history, background to the events. Um, all of that meant that when they were getting all of that interest from the media, um, it was already there and they were able to focus on organizing the actual events. The other thing that was slightly unexpected, I guess, for the organizers was the interviews from press. Um, and this isn't something that we do very often, but it's important to be ready for it. In UK, we have um, media training for volunteers, and I think this is very important. I would say one key takeaway point from the organizers was that the media will pick up your worst line so you have to really stick to your messaging and have in your head some sort of like a sound bite, one sentence that really encapsulates what your event is. And that could be quoted by the media rather than a lengthy explanation of what this event was meant to be. Um, I hope this gives you an idea of how they organized it. One thing I would say is that um, this was mostly focusing on 2015, and it was, um, and the 2016 um, ed edition already happened earlier this year, and there were a couple of learning points. One was to reach out to this local node, so for example, chapters way earlier, so that everything could be coordinated even better, and there could be even more events, um, training beforehand, and just more preparation. Um, it also sounds like with such a big meetup and events, you do need to invest in a bit of infrastructure. So as much as, like I've mentioned earlier, they had uh, Gmail groups, that wasn't quite enough. And going forward, there will be much more of a um, content management system to help with all the inquiries and the coordination. Um, it just seems like the event is going from strength to strength, so it does make sense to invest as much as possible in infrastructure. I hope that I gave justice to the event. Um, I think we've got some time left. Five, we've got five minutes, it sounds. So um, I'm hoping you guys will have some questions and I would like to particularly um, route them towards Richard in case we want to explore things in a bit more detail and how things actually worked out in practice, if that makes sense. And I'll show you some pictures while you think about the questions. <laughs> Richard, do you want to add anything that would be like particular learning point um, from the events that you've done? <laughs> We had about 125 art and feminism events this year. Uh, the program runs in March. You are super welcome to organize, uh, to organize uh, next March, and please let us know uh, early, especially if you're doing it in another language. Uh, we, we probably don't cover, most of the core team is, is English language, so if you want to help organize another language, that would be great, and uh, we'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, this type of project could be done with all sorts of topics. Um, one of the biggest challenges, or at least one of my biggest challenges, was helping to find uh, Wikipedia experience people in uh, each area who could help out, um, who had both the Wikipedia experience and uh, the friendliness to uh, participate. And, and hopefully we, we found enough of them to help in uh, many places. And a lot of these groups are developing on their own, the group in, especially in the group in Toronto and some other ones have been meeting on a monthly basis doing garden feminism minutathons. This is not something we planned on at all, so there's been a lot of spontaneous growth. Um, yeah, that's good. If I can just build on that, I think what is important here is this kind of, like to allow for this spontaneous growth, you have to let go of some of the control, I guess. Um, so there is this interesting balance of giving people training before to try and create some more trainers, give people um, example training packs and example models of how to do the events, but make it very explicit that they don't have to clear everything with some, I don't know, head office organizer body, that they can just go off and do their own thing. Um, so I think that's the main 
message I would like you to take away from this session. Thank you. <laughs>